Well, brothers and sisters, we are on to chapter 5 of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, it is true that taking off a chunk uh, of Scripture this large, uh, a whole chapter of the Bible, it is a lot. Uh, it's a lot to digest, and it is also true that there is so much more that could be or can be pulled out from each of these chapters that that you just can't get to in a sermon. And so I hope that you are continuing to do in your personal or family devotions, you're continuing to go through uh, the Gospel of Mark and talk about that as a family, as, as a couple, as uh, individuals with friends in the church and so on. Uh, because there is always so much more in here. But that being said, it is also really good to get kind of a big picture view of uh, the scriptures on occasion as well. And so we're going to continue on. We're going to read a whole chapter again. We're looking at Mark chapter 5, if you're following along on the screen or at home, uh, however you are looking at this. Chapter 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerizims. <clears throat> when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he fell and he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus fell at his feet, he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, this, this chapter is one in which we can really see how Mark is a guy who really loves the action story. Uh, this is packed with stuff going on, huge things, important things. But for today's purposes, as we look at this, we're going to kind of keep in mind two sort of two words, time and healing. Now, there is a saying, and, and this, was, this was inspired by a conversation, uh, well, truth be told, it's inspired by the Spirit, I believe, but this is inspired partly by a conversation that Cole and I had earlier in the week uh, in which we were talking about this, and we talked about how this sort of has the theme of both time and healing, and we talked about how there's this saying, uh, time heals all wounds. Now, that's not what this sermon is entitled, because time does not actually heal all wounds. That's not true. God actually heals all wounds, and he does so in his own time and in his own way. And so as we go through this, keep that in mind, that there is both time at play here and healing at play here. But there are a couple of details, as often is the case, that we need to unpack uh, before we can get into the message of time and healing here. One is, of course, we need to remind ourselves of a, a bit of the geography and of the political, sociological, anthropological, fancy whatever the heck uh, words that you need to know about this region. Remember, we are still focusing on Jesus ministering in and around the Sea of Galilee, which, if you remember, is sort of in the northern part of Israel. 
<coughs> and uh, it is near Jesus on the uh, on the western side of the Sea of Galilee uh, is Nazareth, which is where uh, Jesus grew up, spent a good chunk of his growing up years. Um, and on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee is uh, a region called the Decapolis, or in this um, the region of the Gerizines we see in verse 1, right? Uh, those, that area is an area of around 10 cities that were, that were sort of built and settled by the, the Romans and that were, uh, they were really secular or, or pagan or Roman uh, cities. They were, they were not Jewish cities, uh, which, which sort of leads us to a bit of an understanding of what's going on here a little bit. Uh, you, you may remember, hopefully, that <coughs> pigs were, for example, unclean animals for Jewish people. And so the Jewish people didn't uh, eat pig meat. Right, and obviously you're not going to, you know, shave pigs for their hair and make clothes out of them. They're not uh, really practical for that, and you're not going to milk them or anything either. So basically, the pigs uh, for Jewish people would be useless, and so a herd of two thousand pigs uh, is, you know odd for a Jewish area, but perfectly reasonable when you are looking at a Gentile area where uh, pig meat is perfectly acceptable. Now, uh, so Jesus, he has this thing where most of his time is spent ministering among the Jewish people, but occasionally he goes out of his way to get over to the sort of Gentile side of the lake and speak with and heal and minister to the Gentiles. And this is an early hint that Jesus' gospel is not one that is reserved just for the Jews, but is one that is, is set aside for the whole world and all people in that world. And, and that gets unpacked more as we see the progression of the book of Acts and the work of the Holy Spirit and the bringing of the gospel message to uh, through Paul and the other apostles to uh, the Gentile people. Anyways, so Jesus was on the Jewish side of the lake. He takes a journey over to the Gentile side of the lake, if we can say it that way. Um, and there he comes across this man who is uh, full of demons. Now, uh, Aaron, can you remind me and tell me how many soldiers were in a Roman legion? You cannot. Okay, Aaron's supposed to be like the historian in our family. Eli... 2,000? Really? 6,000? A lot. Okay, we got some debate. That's okay. Debate is fine. We got a lot of soldiers, though. Okay? All right. What's that? That was Ben's project? Okay. Ben, ben Smith. Why aren't you here, Ben? Anyways. Um, so there were a lot of soldiers in a Roman legion, <coughs> and uh, hence the name legion for this uh, grouping of demons. Six thousand is correct. Ooh, six thousand. Way to go. If this was Jeopardy, you'd have the points. <laughs> Although you didn't form it in the phrase of a question or whatever. <laughs> six thousand. Eli, you need to do more study. <laughs> so 6,000 6, in, a, in a legion, but uh, obviously this is, you know, symbolic for a lot of demons, right? So much so that this man is absolutely crazy and so filled with demonic strength and power that nobody can hold him or restrain him even with chains. And yet Jesus heals this man. Now here's where both time and healing come into place, right? Jesus has already been over to this side of the lake before. We don't know whether Jesus would have particularly known of 
this man, although chances are pretty good, seeing as, you know, he had a reputation, and yet he did not heal this man on previous occasions, right? And, and this man has, has suffered from this demonic possession for an awful long time. And yet, now, Jesus comes over and heals this man and drives out the demons. Why then? Why not earlier? And why this man and maybe not someone else? Those are questions that we often find ourselves asking as we look at healing, miraculous healing and, and, and driving out of demons. Why does this person get healed and not that person? Why does this person get healed now and not then or then and not now? And the reality is, is that it is tied into something that is thematically true across the whole of scriptures, and that is God's timing. Remember, at the end of this chapter, when we read about the, the girl being healed, Jesus says, <coughs> or Jesus gives strict orders in verse 43 not to let anyone know about this. And remember, why, why is that? There's a, there's a phrase that we are talking about, the messianic what? The Messianic Secret. Hey, somebody watch the sermons online. Yay! Uh, the Messianic Secret, right? This is this idea throughout Mark that we read over and over again is that Jesus doesn't want people to be distracted from the good news that God loves them by the question or debate about whether he's the Son of God, whether he's the Messiah, blah, 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 until the time is right until God's timing is perfect, right? And this is true for the, for, the, for the very birth of Jesus himself. In the fullness of time, the scripture says, Jesus became a child, an infant, a human being. Jesus wasn't born as a human being 300 years before, before his actual birth, right? He was born in a particular time, in a particular place, for reasons, capital R. <laughs> reasons. Right? Some theologians and people have speculated that one of the reasons that Jesus was born during that time period was that the Roman Empire was so powerful at that time. And the infrastructure of roads and the, the freedom to have commerce in various parts of the world and the pacifying influence of the Roman Empire, that enabled the gospel to spread throughout the world in a way that perhaps it never could have done before. Is that the sole reason why Jesus was born when he was born? Probably not. But regardless, there is a sense in the scriptures of the fullness of time. When the time is right, and it is true for this man as well. Why was this demon-possessed man healed now? Because now was the right time. Now was the right time. And we can, we can wrestle with that because the reality is that he suffered for some unknown amount of time before that. Why did he have to suffer all that time? And this is where the unsatisfying pastor answer comes. I don't know. Any more than I know why you may suffer for some period of time. Some of you, some of us, for seemingly our whole lives in some area. 
I don't know. But God does. This is where faith comes into play as well. Right? When God says, and we've said it over and over again, when God says that he works all things to the good of those who love him, then that includes, like we talked about last week, even death. It includes even things like this. Somehow, God transformed demon possession, which is, by all accounts, a very bad thing. God transforms that through the redeeming and healing power of Jesus Christ into something that does something profoundly good for this man. C.S. Lewis has said in his book, The Great Divorce, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm sorry, but he has said that when we get to heaven, everything that will have gone before, everything that happened in our lives, regardless of what it was, will be transformed so that it feels like it was a foretaste of heaven. All the experience of our whole life, will be washed fully and completely with the blood of the Lamb so that even those terrible, horrible, bad things, whether done by us or done to us or, or, or just happening in our lives, those things will be transformed so that we see them as redeemed and good and beautiful because of what God has made out of them. In a like manner, C.S. Lewis, again paraphrasing, says that everything, if we were to go to hell, if we were to end up in hell, everything that would have gone before would have been a foretaste of hell. That all that had gone on before in our lives would be leading up to us being in hell. And so we can see for this man that God's timing and God's healing are perfect. And for him, it all starts to be a foretaste of glory divine. Why else? Why else would the demon-possessed man beg to go with Jesus? Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. He's now had that taste of heaven. He's had that taste of who God is. He knows, perhaps more than so many of us, he knows in whom his hope is rooted. And it is in Jesus very clearly and very concretely. And so he begs to go with him. And you could see, what, what, is Jesus being cruel by saying, no, no, don't come with me. You may not come with me. No, of course Jesus is not being cruel. Again, Jesus is doing what is good and right and perfect and his timing is good and he says to this man, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And, and the man does and the people he comes into contact with are amazed and we can see maybe not the direct fruit of this, but we can see the fruit of this later on when the apostles finally wake up and realize that the gospel is meant for all people, not just Jewish people. They find that, that Gentiles are becoming believers here, there, and everywhere, partly through the testimony of someone like this demon-possessed man, partly through the testimony of the Samaritan woman partly through other testimonies of people who were healed by Jesus in Gentile regions of Palestine. But God's timing continues on, of course. And when we get to verses 21 and following, we, we see another person who has been afflicted for a long time. 
my kids um, and, and, and I through them sometimes have uh, especially this is sort of Kieran's fault mostly uh, yeah don't worry it's a good thing you're good um, ha they picked up on a podcast called Sawbones right Sawbones is this uh, this podcast where they talk about medical things and one of the things they talk about often is historical practices of doctors um, and some of them are really, really horrible. Uh, who is it? Pliny the Elder that they're always quoting? Pliny the Elder was some doctor from way back in the days of the Romans and the Greeks and stuff like this, and, and he had some really wacky ideas about medical stuff. Like things like you're supposed to eat certain kinds of poo in order to make you feel better or something. I don't know. Weird stuff right? This poor woman who lives in this time, she has been suffering from bleeding and, you know, I mean, it's, we translate it, uh, <laughs> we translate it a little bit inappropriately in a way. We kind of, we kind of have this tendency sometimes in our English translations to clean up things a little bit. We're talking about menstrual bleeding, basically. We're talking about um, that for years and years and years. And I know many women who have struggled with iron deficiency from regular menstrual bleeding, let alone having to deal with constant bleeding for years. But then on top of that, this poor woman, verse 26, had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. This is back on the Jewish side of the lake. This is back in the region where Jesus spent the majority of the first half of his ministry time. This is back in Jesus' home territory. It's not like this woman hasn't been around. But not only that, it's not like God hasn't been around. I mean, God has been around the whole time. Why did God let this woman suffer for so many years? Why would God let her suffer for 12 years? Not only from the bleeding, but also from the horrible ministrations of so-called doctors. I don't know. I don't know why. But again, God's timing is perfect. Somehow God's timing is perfect. And this woman finally moved by desperation and by faith and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. She reaches out in tremendous faith to just touch the hem of of his cloak. We don't have a whole lot of examples, if any, of people touching Jesus' clothes to be healed. There are a couple instances where uh, it says that people want to do that, but in this particular instance it's very dramatically clear that this woman's faith and this woman's heart cause her to reach out and touch even though she is so afraid because remember not only is she suffering from this menstrual bleeding not only is she suffered under the hands of doctors but in Jewish society people who were have women who were having their periods were were what unclean right and so this woman, according to proper Jewish custom and religious law, was an outsider. She was ostracized. She was bleeding and hurting and suffering and alone. It's no wonder that she's afraid when Jesus calls her out. Right? But she comes and he gives her in addition to the healing he gives her love 
daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Of course, now you can start to think that, uh oh, God's timing is now messed up because Jairus' daughter in the meantime has died while Jesus is spending time with this woman who sucked power out of his cloak. At least that's how maybe the crowd and maybe Jairus himself might have felt. And then we get to a, a, a little bit of a difficulty that we need to deal with. Right, Jesus comes to the home of Jairus after assuring Jairus, saying, don't be afraid, just believe. They come to the home, and Jesus sees the commotion of the people grieving and mourning, and that was part of the cultural custom, is that people would cry and wail loudly in that place and in that time. Um, and, and Jesus says, while this commotion and wailing, the child is not dead, but asleep. Now, this is a difficult thing, because the, the story is titled, Jesus Raises a Dead Girl and Heals a Sick Woman. Now, those, those titles are, are put there afterwards. They weren't included in the original manuscripts. But still, is the child dead, or is the child not dead? Well, the truth is, is that we don't really know the answer to that actually fully. Uh, a lot of theologians believe that Jesus, uh, who is using a particular kind of language here, uh, may be alluding to the belief that uh, in Jewish, Jewish belief and custom that, that death is, is like falling asleep. Death is like falling asleep. And so it could be that Jesus is speaking in spiritual metaphors and saying, you know, hey, um, everybody who dies is not really dead, but they have fallen asleep in the Lord. And certainly we see that in other parts of the scripture, that, that idea of falling asleep in the Lord. Or it could be that this child was in a, a coma of such a kind that it would be very difficult to discern this child's breathing or heartbeat. Um, and the child was not actually dead, but was uh, alive in some way that perhaps only Jesus could discern. Regardless, Jesus comes to her, and after everyone else thinks that it is too late, He takes her by the hand and says to her, little girl, get up. Why did Jairus and his family have to suffer seeing this little girl struggle and die? Why did she have to go through this? Why does any 12-year-old have to go through terrible suffering and sorrow, and even death. Again, I don't know. But again, God's timing is perfect, and he heals. He heals. Now, what does this all mean for us? In some ways, it's difficult to say what it means for you, particularly in your suffering at this time or previously or in the future, in detail, no one but God knows. On the other hand, it means a great deal because the reality is that our faith is rooted in a God whose promises are true. The whole world is struggling with the one-year anniversary of the pandemic. Why do we all have to suffer, whether it's from COVID or the effects of COVID? I don't know. How long will we have to suffer? I don't know. When will God's healing come? I don't know. 
And tied into all of that, how will God's healing come? That I don't know either. But the reality is, and we've talked about this before, that God always heals and that his timing is perfect. Now we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Because we're not talking only one kind of healing or one method of healing here. Jesus uses miraculous healing and, and uh, driving out demons and so on uh, in, in pretty, pretty dramatic ways. But that is not the only way that God heals. When, when I talk with people uh, uh, who are dealing with sickness and death, I share with them that God chooses to heal sometimes through our body's own processes. We get colds, we get sick, we, we get better. Our immune system works, we get better. We break an arm, somebody sets the arm, and we get better. Right? The body's own processes, which are created by God, are the, one of the ways that God chooses to heal us. Other times, God chooses to heal us through medical professionals. Jeanette, hopefully, Lord willing, is going to experience that in not too long. Many of us, probably all of us at one point or another, have experienced that. But God gives us the wisdom as human beings to learn how to help the body. And unlike the doctors in Sawbones, history, podcast thingies, a lot of our medical professional stuff is amazing and incredible. And sometimes God heals through that. And sometimes, like in these stories, God heals through miraculous intervention through the miracles performed by the power of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And sometimes, God heals by gathering us home to be with him. Many of us have experienced that grief and also relief where our loved one who had been suffering gets brought home and is whole and is healthy with God face to face. You see, God works all things to the good of those who love him. Providing healing for people. So in this pandemic age, when we are looking at the one-year anniversary and we are all struggling with COVID fatigue or whatever, and some of us may have even experienced people whom we love getting COVID, in this time, let's cling to and share with others the reality of God's healing and God's timing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your healing and for your timing. We don't claim to understand all the ins and outs of how you choose your timing and why you choose to heal some people in certain ways and other people in other ways. But God, we do know that your promises are true and that you do bring healing to all of those who love you. Thank you. Thank you for your healing touch. May we share it with others wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.